Welcome to this YSL Excel VBA tutorial. This video covers a few functions that you may find useful for splitting long strings into their constituent parts. We'll begin by having a look at how to extract characters from the left, middle and right of a string using the left, mid and right functions, funnily enough. We'll take a brief detour to explain why some function names in VBA end in a dollar sign and explain why that's the case. And then we'll move on and look at how you can find the position of one string inside another using the instring and instring reverse functions. We'll see a slightly more practical example of using those functions to split a full name into the first and surname, and we'll encounter a few difficulties with that as well, depending on exactly how many parts to a name there are. We'll look at how you can then split a string into multiple component parts using either a loop or using the split function. And then the final part of the video is going to have a look at a slightly more practical example of using the split function to read a tab delimited text file into cells in a worksheet. So lots to do here, let's get started. OK, so the starting point for this video is our fairly standard workbook full of data about movies. If you want to download a copy for yourselves, I'll stick a link in the video description, or if you already have a copy from the previous video in the series, this is exactly the same data set, so feel free to carry on using that one if you prefer. What we'll do from there is head straight to the Developer tab and then straight to the Visual Basic Editor, and we'll have a brand new module, and inside that module we'll, we'll create a quick simple subroutine called something like Basic String Splitting Functions. So we're going to have a look at a few of the very basic functions for splitting strings into their component parts. I'm going to begin by declaring a variable to hold a string, so I can say dimS as string, or if you watched the previous video in the series you will remember you can say simply dimS$ using the type declaration character. Personally I prefer to write out the full explicit data type. So I'm going to say dim s as string, and then I'm going to say s is equal to range a 15 dot value. So I'm going to store the value of a cell from the workbook that you can hopefully still see in the background there, which is going to be the, the text I am legend. So range a 15 dot value. I'm going to start by printing a few basic values into the immediate window. If you don't already have that displayed, you can head to the view menu at the top of the screen and choose immediate window, or just press Ctrl and G on the keyboard. And the first thing I'll do is just debug.print the entire string, so debug.print s. What I'd also like to do is return just the very first character of that string. And there's a function that's, that's designed to allow you to return a number of characters from the left hand side of a, of a string. It's called left. So if I say debug.print, and then if I press control and space just so that you can see this function in the IntelliSense list, there's a function there called left. There's actually quite a few variations on the left function, but I'm going to stick with the absolute basic one to begin with. So I'm going to go for the left function, open some parentheses, you'll see there are two compulsory parameters, string and length. So string is the string you want to extract your characters from, length is how many specific characters you want, so I want to get one single character. So having done that, if I were to just run that subroutine using F5, unsurprisingly I get the full string on the first line and then the first single character from the second line. Now I could have achieved the same result using a slightly different version of the left function. Let's have another quick look in the IntelliSense list if I say debug.print and then press Control and space and look for the left function again. You'll see there's, there's a version of the left function that has a dollar sign after its name. So just as I mentioned, the dollar sign indicates the type declaration character for strings in VBA. I could have declared this variable s as dim s$ dollar, and then I wouldn't have had to enter as string. So this indicates that this particular version of the function returns a string, and you can prove that actually if you open the set of parentheses after its name. You'll see at the very end of the parameter list it says it returns its value as a string. It's also got a set type for the input parameter, which uh, the, the first parameter there called string, its data type is also a string. That's slightly different for the previous version of this function. If I click just somewhere inside the parentheses and press Ctrl and I on the keyboard to display the tooltip, you'll see that it doesn't have a return type. So this version of the function returns a variant, which just happens to have a subtype of string. Its first parameter as well doesn't have a set type, so that allows you to pass in a variant as well. Now, this doesn't make a huge amount of difference in a practical sense in most cases. Supposedly, the dollar sign, the typed version of this function, is slightly more efficient. Variants are slightly less efficient to work with in VBA, so if you can set a specific type using left dollar, then this will supposedly give you a little bit more performance. In reality, you're not going to see a huge amount of difference unless you're doing lots and lots and lots of calculations involving left. Where this does have an effect, if I can show you first of all that this returns the exact same answer if I just pass in exactly the same um, arguments 
for the previous function. Let's just clear the contents of the immediate window as well and then run the subroutine again. You'll see that I get exactly the same results for both of those two functions. Where this does have an effect is if you're ever going to work with strings that could potentially contain null. Now null is a concept more associated with database design, so if you were programming in Access VBA, for instance, you're much more likely to encounter this sort of situation. Although it's quite possible that you're writing code in Excel VBA that returns data from a database that might contain nulls and strings in the same field. So if I were to just copy and paste these two lines and then show you what happens if I try to pass a null into either of these two. Let's just comment out these two as well so we don't get a hugely messy immediate window. If I go for the original left function and pass in a null, then although I'm not going to return any values, of course, and any sensible results, let me just comment this one out as well. If I were to run this one, at least it actually works. It returns something. You see the word null actually appears. That's the return value when you do pass in a null. Let's just clear the contents of the immediate window and then we'll comment this one out and then uncomment the other one and I'll try to pass a null into the left dollar function. So if I pass in a null and then try to execute that subroutine it fails with a runtime error and of course if I click debug it's failed on the line in which I've tried to pass a null to a version of the function which can only accept and work with string values. So, um, for safety, particularly if you're working in Access or with database data, it's better to use the left function without the dollar sign. If you're desperately trying to eke out the last bit of performance from your VBA code, then supposedly it's technically faster to use the typed version left dollar. Just because I'm lazy more than anything else, and you'll tend to find that most people just stick with the left function. You, it's quite rare to see left dollar used in the real world, and that's what I'm going to go with for the rest of this video. I'm going to use the, uh, the non-typed versions of these functions. Now there are one or two more versions of the left function that in the real world you're highly unlikely to encounter, but I'm going to mention them very quickly just to avoid having loads of questions at the bottom of the video asking why I didn't cover them. So let's just comment out the last one that we've just written there, we know that doesn't work, and let's have another look in the IntelliSense list if I say debug.print and then press control and space and look for left B, that's the next version in the list. There's a left B and a left B dollar, so that obviously the dollar sign indicates the typed version of the function, whereas the non-dollar sign version is the untyped version so you can accept nulls. So let's go with the left B. What B stands for in this case is bytes. So if I open the parentheses you'll see exactly the same parameter list as last time. You need to pass in a string, so let's pass in S, and then a length from that string that you want to return. Let's go for 1, and if I close the parentheses and hit enter, then let's just clear the contents of the immediate window and run that subroutine, and what you'd expect to get, I imagine, would be to get the letter I printed after the full film name. But of course, this case, in this case, you don't. If I double up the number of characters I'm asking for, so if I go for two, and then run that one again, I'll get I am legend and I. If I double it, um, let's go for six. So if I wanted the first three characters, I go for six rather than just um, three, and I get the first three characters. So what the, uh, what the length parameter is asking for in this case isn't the number of characters you want, it's the number of bytes of data you want from each string. So basically you need to double up the number of bytes um, from the num for, for the number of characters that you want to get. If you're desperately interested in how that works, there's a fascinating um, article written on the Microsoft website that about explains all about character sets. And in particular, what you might be interested in is the section on double byte character sets, DBCS. So a fascinating little uh, bit of information there about how uh, characters work and how character sets work in VBA, in programming in general, actually. Um, it's a fairly generic article. Um, I say interesting, I say fascinating, I'm, I'm the sort of person who spends his evenings and weekends making videos on Excel VBA, so perhaps I'm not the best person to judge, but just in case you're interested, that's where you can go to have a quick look. What we'll do at this point is switch back to the VB editor, and I'm going to get rid of all these little bits of code that don't work, and I'm going to go back to the original version of that using the basic left function, uncomment that, so we're back to effectively where we started. Now there are another couple of functions that perform a very similar job to the left function, but hopefully it stands to reason that if you can get characters from the left of a string, you could, should also be able to get them from the right, and maybe perhaps also from the middle of the string. 
Let's have another look at a couple of other functions then. Let's have another debug.print statement, and I'll press Control and Space to display the IntelliSense. And if you haven't already guessed, there's the function called write. So there's uh, several different versions of the write function, just like for the left function. There's an untyped version, which is what I'm going to use, a typed version, a bytes version, and a bytes typed version of the function. Let's stick with the easiest, laziest one to use. Let's go for the write function, open some parentheses, pass in my string, and this time I want to get six characters from the right-hand side of the string. There's another function that lets you get characters from the middle of a string, so I can say debug.print, and I can say mid, and again if I press control and space you'll see there's a typed and untyped, a bytes and a bytes typed version of the same function. Slightly more complex in terms of the parameter list, there's an extra parameter, but I need to start by passing in the string. Then I've got to specify the starting position from when I want to get my text. Every string of text is indexed in VBA, so every character has a, a position, has a number which indicates its position in the string. So in VBA, strings are, are indexed from 1, so the, the letter I is character number 1, the space is character number 2, A is character number 3, etc. So if I wanted to get the letters AM, then I'd have to specify that I want to start at character number 3, and if I only wanted the next two characters, then I'd have to specify that in this optional parameter here, length. It is optional, so if I missed that out, then what would happen is the mid function would return everything from character number three all the way to the end of the string. But I definitely only want the last, the next two characters, so let's pass in a value to the length parameter there as well. I'm going to clear the contents of the media window, and then if I were to run this subroutine, we'll end up with the I am legend, but printed out as legend I am, sort of like semi Yoda speak kind of uh, version of the film name. So there you go, there's some of the, the, the most basic functions you can use to pick bits of text out of a longer string, right, left, and mid. So now that we've seen the absolute basics, let's move on and look at some of the slightly more sophisticated things we can do in terms of picking apart strings. I'm going to make a copy of this entire subroutine first of all, and then let's paste it in down below. And of course we'll need to change the name of the subroutine, so let's change its name so it's called something like Finding Character Positions, which gives you a bit of a clue about what we're about to do. I'm going to clear the contents of the immediate window as well, and I just want to make sure that we can see, this time rather than the film names, I'd like to be able to see the director names in the list. I'm just going to scroll across a couple of columns so we can see some of the director names. Um, just a makes for a slightly easier demonstration for me. So back to the VB editor. I'm going to change the first cell that I refer to. I'm going to refer to cell C3 to begin with. That's a fairly nice short name. So cell C3, and I'm going to debug.print the full string first of all. And then what I'm going to do is debug.print the left three characters from that string. So left s, comma, three. And if I were to also say debug.print right s, comma, and then one, two, three, four, five, that will give me the, uh, the last name. That will separate out the first name from the last name of Sam Raimi. Now, although the numbers 3 and 5 work reasonably well for getting the first and last name for Sam Raimi, they're pretty hopeless at working out the same piece of information for anybody else in the list. So if I just change the cell reference that I was referring to, so let's say C2 and then run that subroutine again, um, that's clearly not the first and last name of Steven Spielberg, and so on and so on and so on, so you could probably have a bit of fun with this sort of thing, see what the funniest name you can generate. Jammerun, there we go, I think that's probably going to be my favourite from the list. So, clearly that's not a, a very good way to, uh, to split the first name into the last name using functions in VBA. What we really need to do is establish which character separates the first name from the last name, and we're going to assume for the moment that it's going to be a space character, and then we want to get all the characters to the left of the space and all the characters to the right of the space using functions. So let's just clear the contents of the immediate window, and let's have a think about how we can calculate the position of one character, one string within another string. The key to solving this problem is another VBA string function called instra or instring, and what that does is returns the position of one string inside another string. So just to demonstrate the basics of how that works, let's debug.print the position of the space character inside somebody's name. So if I say debug.print and then look for the instra function, you'll notice there's another a, a byte version of that. There's no typed version of the instra function, though it returns a number in this case. So if I open the parentheses for the instring function, you'll see there are four different um, optional parameters, they're all optional. So I'm going to look, f I'm going to specify the start position first of all, which I'm going to start searching from the very first character in the string. Then what I would like to do is say what string of text I'm looking in, so that's going to be the full name, so I've got that stored in my variable S. 
then I can say which string I'm looking for. So that could be a single character or it could be a, a multiple characters. In this case, it's going to be a space character. There is one final fourth parameter there as well, the compare mode. Now, if you watched a previous video in the series, you'll be aware that string comparisons by default in VBA are case sensitive. So that's what this says here. VB binary compare means that it's a case sensitive search. So if I were looking for the letter A in somebody's name, for instance, then I'd need to make sure that it was the correct case using the, the default settings. As I'm looking for a space, well, you can't have capital spaces, so it doesn't really matter in this example. Um, but if you did want to specify which particular um, comparison mode you were working with, just specify it here at the, uh, the end of the parameter list. So binary compare means that it's case sensitive, text compare means that it's not case sensitive, and database compare uses the setting of the database you're working with, which is completely redundant in Excel VBA. It's only used in Access. So in this case, we don't need to specify it at all because it, we're looking for a space character. So if I were to run that subroutine now looking for James Cameron, so we're looking at cell C6, we'll see that the position of the space character in James Cameron's full name is position 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So if we can establish the position of the space which separates the first name from the last name, we can get all the characters to the left of that position and all the characters to the right of that position fairly easily. So let's have a quick look at doing that. Let's store the result of the instring function first of all in a variable so we can re more easily reference it later on. Let's declare a new variable. I'm going to call this one first space and then store that as a long, a long integer. And then rather than just debug.printing that value, I'm going to say first space equals the result of that function. What that means I can do now is return all the characters to the right of that position. So I can say debug.print left s comma, rather than refer to the number three, I can say first space. Now, in this case, what that would do is it would return six characters. So that would include the space along with the word James. So if I simply subtract one from the result of the first space variable, I can just return the first five characters. So let's do that by saying first space minus one. Now, returning the last name is a little bit tricky depending on which function you want to use. If I wanted to use the right function, then it's not just sufficient to return, in this case, six characters from the right of the string. That would just get me Amaran in this particular case, which isn't particularly useful. So what I want to do instead, if I wanted to do this using the right function, I would want to return a number of characters that's equal to the full length of the string, which for James Cameron is 6 plus 7, which is 13, minus the position of the space, which is 6, so that, returns, so that leaves me with 7 characters, and that will leave me with the 7 characters in his last name. So to calculate the length of the full name, I can say len s, so the len function returns the number of characters in the string, minus the first space position. So that's one technique you could use to achieve that. I find that a little bit fiddly, a little bit awkward. Somewhat easier if you wanted to use the mid function. So just to demonstrate that this will work also with a mid function, I can say debug.print, and then say mid, and then say s, comma, and then just say first space plus one. Much simpler and neater. So just to demonstrate that all that works, let's just get rid of the contents of the immediate window, and then run the entire thing from scratch, and we'll end up with James Cameron, James Cameron, and Cameron. If we wanted to test that it was definitely working, let's just comment out the uh, one of the two uh, expressions that gets the surname, and let's change the cell reference. So let's go for C2, I suppose, and then run that one again, and we get Steven Spielberg, Steven and Spielberg. We should go for C3, make sure it works for a short name like Sam Raimi, which it does, and so on and so on. So it's fairly robust now, and we'll always return the first and last name, assuming there's a single space character that separates the first name from the last name. So assuming that we can guarantee some kind of consistency in the way the first and last name are separated, this little set of expressions works beautifully. But that's not always going to be the case. Let's say, for example, we looked at cell number 36, let's say C36. Um, I clearly plucked that one just off the top of my head. Um, if I run that one, I'm going to end up with Lily, um, formerly Andy Wachowski, and I get the first name is Lily, but the surname comes out as Andy Wachowski, which isn't quite right. The surname is still just Wachowski. If I were to change that again, let's pluck another one out of the air without looking. I'm going to pick number of uh, cell number 43. So if I go for 43 and then run that one again, I'm going to end up with JJ Abrams. 
And his first name is just J, and his surname is J Abrams, which isn't particularly useful. So, in both of these cases, the first name is everything to... Sorry, the last name, the surname, I should say, is everything to the right of the last space in the name. The first names are everything to the left of the last space. So what I wanted to find um, the last space in the name rather than just the first space in the name. Let's add in another variable. So I've got first space as long, let's say dim last space as long. And then what I essentially want to do in this case is search for the space character but looking in the reverse direction in the string. So fortunately there's a function that does that. Let's have a new line in there that says last space equals and then it's another version of the instra function. It's called instra rev, instring reverse, um, the full name or the full title for that function. So you've got to pass in a number of different parameters here. So the, uh, the first parameter is the string you're looking in called string check. The second parameter is the string match, so in this case it's going to be another space. Then you can also specify a starting position and again the compare mode, but we don't need to specify either of those two in this particular case. We want to start from the right hand side of the string and look in this direction. The return value will still be the count of the character from the left, so it's going to search for a space from the right hand side of JJ Abrams, and it's going to find that that character is the, the first space from the reverse direction, but its actual position will be reported as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, so that it's the sixth character from the left. Okay, so just to demonstrate how we could then use that to get the last name separated out, let's go for the first name being, well actually the first name is everything to the left of the, the last space for these two particular examples. So let's change the, uh, the first space to last space there. And then once again, let's change the first space to last space for the mid. And I'll spell that properly. Just clear the contents of the immediate window, so I should still be looking at JJ Abrams at this point. And if I were to run that subroutine, I'll find that I get JJ as the first name and Abrams as the second. Let's switch back to number 36, was it? And then run that one again, and I get Lily Andy Wachowski as first and last name separated out. But this should still work equally well for people with just a single space in their name. So I go back to cell C3, I still get Sam Raimi, and C2 will still be Steven Spielberg. Now let's go for another completely random plucked out of the air different cell reference. Let's go for cell number C87 to start with. And if I were to just clear the contents of the immediate window and then run that one again, I'll get a chap called Brian De Palma. And I get his first name is Brian Durr and last name is Palmer. I'm not quite sure that's quite correct. And then if I go to uh, cell, let's pick another one completely at random, um, cell C103 and run that one again, I get Mr. M. Night Shyamalan. I think that's a pronunciation, so I get the last name is Shyamalan and the first name is M. Knight, and again I'm not quite sure whether that's correct or not. Um, what if I went for somebody like number 251, um, just completely randomly out of the air, if I run that one, um, a German chap, Florian Henkel von Donnersmark, I believe he's German anyway at least, he directed a German film anyway, um, so what's the first name and the last name in that particular situation? I'm not entirely sure. Um, it's at this point that you basically give up trying to use Excel VBA functions to split apart your names, um, because how can you tell for any individual person what the first name and the last name is? Um, there is no consistent pattern in this respect whatsoever. This is where you say to your database developers, design me a proper database that separates the first name from the last name in the first place so I don't have to deal with this sort of situation. If you ever fill in a form on a website, you enter your first name in a separate box to your last name. And this is exactly the reason why, because trying to sort it out afterwards is an absolute pain. So, um, there is one other particular situation though that we can handle using VBA code. So that's what if a person doesn't have a space in their name at all. So let's change this cell reference one more time. Let's go for cell 893. And if I attempt to run the subroutine this time, what I end up with is a runtime error. And the reason I've received a runtime error in this case is because the person whose name I've returned, Mr. McG, hasn't got a space in his name. Um, he's the chap who directed Charlie's Angels, and Charlie's Angels 
the sequel, um, I think that's pretty much it. Um, I'm sure he's directed one or two more films, probably weren't very good, but with a name like McGee, what can you expect? What a stupid name. Anyway, it's causing us a problem. The problem is, if I can step through the procedure up to the point where it fails, it's going to fail when I attempt to return characters from the left of the strings. So if I hit F8 at that point, that's the point where I receive the runtime error. Clicking debug shows me that the first space and last space variables contain zero. So when you can't find the character, in the string you're looking for, then the results of the instra and instra rev functions are both zero. So at this point I'm trying to subtract one from the value zero, giving me of course minus one, and then I try to return minus one characters from the left of the string, which clearly isn't going to work. So here's what I need to do in this case. Let's just stop the subroutine from running. There's actually a couple of different approaches I could use, but having established that I know that the instra and instra rev functions return zero, if the string can't be found, we could use that to our advantage. We could just simply say, if first space equals zero, then I can just debug.print the entire first name. So let's just copy and paste that from there. Otherwise, or else, what I would like to do is print out the separated out first names from last names, and then that will solve that basic symbol problem. So if I just clear the contents of the immediate window and then run the subroutine again, that will show me that I get McG and McG printed out. Now it is a little tiny bit inefficient to calculate the results of in-string and in-string reverse before you then test if the space was in the name in the first place. It might be easier, or more efficient at least, slightly, to do it this way around instead. So once you've cal uh, stored the string of the name, what we could do is check if s like. So you might remember, remember the like operator from the previous video in the series where we were talking about comparing strings. The cool thing about the like operator is that you can use wildcard matches. So if I wanted to find out if there was a space in the name that I've just stored, I could say if s is like an asterisk, which is any number of any characters, a space, another asterisk, again any number of any characters, then close the double quotes, then. So if it's the case that I find a space in somebody's name, I can then calculate the position of the first and last space, um, and then I, I need to rearrange this entire thing. This is slightly annoying, but anyway, never mind. Let's move the debug.print statements for the separate first name and last names, and then I can change this around so I don't have the other if statements in there. Otherwise, I would just print out the first names. So let's copy and paste debug.print s. So slightly change the order. I should have just maybe just changed the logic of this. So it said if not s like, then this pattern. Anyway, I've done this now. So let's carry on with this. If I run the subroutine again, what we ought to find out is I get exactly the same result. So I just get mcg printed out. But if I change the cell reference back to let's say let's go for 251 again, I suppose, um, and then run that one again, I get Mr. Florian Hengel von and then his surname is Donna Smark, and then of course I can go back to number good old Sam Raimi number three, or number two, Steven Spielberg. So it should just work for every single case. Now I mentioned earlier on that it's kind of difficult to split a string into its constituent parts when you don't know how many parts there are going to be. It's kind of tricky but not impossible. There's a couple of different techniques you could use to do this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch back to looking at the film names just because there's a bit more variety in how many different words there are in each film name. Some have much longer names than, uh, than others. Now you're probably thinking that if you wanted to achieve this incredibly quickly, you could just use a simple Excel feature. So there's a data tab in the ribbon up here. Um, and if I would just highlighted the entirety of column A and then had a look in the um, the data tab of the ribbon and looked at the text to columns feature. If I launch the text to columns feature, there's a nice simple little wizard that would allow me to split each individual string into its constituent parts using any delimiter character that I liked. So I could choose to delimit them with a space and you'll see as I scroll through the list, it splits, it splits each individual um, film name into its individual words. So that would be by far and away the quickest, simplest way to do this if you were in a rush, if you wanted to hurry, or if you just wanted to get the data out as quickly as possible. Um, we could invoke this feature in VBA as well. I'm not sure, I don't think I have a video about that, but that's one on the list at least. Of course, this video is all about using string functions, so we're going to take a slightly more tricky approach using string functions and loops to achieve the same end result. So it may not be that your data is stored in columns. You might be getting your data from um, from um, an access database, or it might be read from a text file. It could be coming from a variety of different places. You might not have the option to apply the text to columns feature. So let's have a look at how to do this the uh, the, the the geeky way, I suppose. The uh, 
the, the one that the more satisfying way I should say let's insert a new module for this and get this little bit set up so we're gonna have a new subroutine um, that's gonna say uh, loop to split text and we'll begin by declaring a couple of different variables. I'm going to have dim s as string as we had previously, and then I'm going to have dim this space. Excuse me, I'll spell this properly eventually. This space as long, and then another variable called dim last space as long. I should call that previous space, I suppose, but last as in previous. Just to get started, I'm going to set my s variable to refer to a cell with a quite a longer fill name in it, with quite a lot of spaces. So I'm going to say s equals range a11 dot value. So clearly there are several spaces in there. And then what I want to do first of all is calculate the position of this space. So this space equals, then I'll use the instra function again, starting at character number one, looking inside my string for a space character. Now I know from the cell that I've just picked here that there's definitely going to be a space returned, but I might later on want to test this for films which don't contain a space in their name. So the next thing to do is establish if this space equals zero, so I'm going to use the result of the instring function to test this rather than the wildcard matches I looked at earlier on. If that's the case, then all I'm going to do is debug.print s. So I can say debug.print, I can say debug.print eventually. Otherwise I want to do something a little bit more sophisticated. Basically what I want to achieve is, as long as I continue finding space characters in the name, I want to carry on printing out constituent parts. So let's start by having a simple do while loop. I'd like to say do while this space is greater than zero. So as long as I'm continuing to find space characters, carry on doing the instructions inside this loop. I'll give myself a couple of blank lines and then close the loop by writing the word loop, then head back up and the first thing I'd like to do inside the loop is print out the first word that I found. So I'm going to debug.print the first word using the mid function, which we haven't seen for a little while. So I'm going to say debug.print mid, then I'm going to say s comma. The start character is going to be the last space, as in previous space, plus one. So I'm going to say, um, sorry, I did call it last space, last space plus one. Then the number of characters I want to return is going to be equal to this space minus last space. So that gives me the difference in characters between each space, or the difference in number of characters between each space. If I then close the parentheses, that will print out this the word that I'm currently looking at. Once I've done that, I would like to use the last space variable, and I'd like it to store the current position of this space. So last space equals this space. And then finally, I want to recalculate the next space, or the this space variable again. So I'm going to say this space equals, and then look for instra, in starting at the position this space plus one. So I want to look after the character that I'm currently looking at. So I don't want to find the same space again that I'm just looking at. I want to find the next one. So start with the next character along and then look inside your string and return a space. Uh, sorry, look for a space, beg your pardon. Once that loop is finished, there'll be one last value to print out and that's the very last word. So after the loop, I'm going to say debug.print and then say mid s comma last space plus one and I'm not going to bother specifying a length this time I'm just going to print everything else to the very end of the string okay so um, if I were to clear the contents of the immediate window and then just run the subroutine from start to finish if I hit f5 just to prove that it works I get individually separated out Harry Potter and the order of the Phoenix there we go and it should work for any film as well if I set this to be a film like cell a two I suppose like Jurassic Park just two words in there if I run this one I will get Jurassic Park if I set it to a film with a single word like a six that will just print out Titanic now for me it's kind of satisfying to do that sort of thing but it's hopelessly complicated when you see this next little technique there's a much much easier way to split a string based on a single specific delimiter character so what I'm going to do here, if I write a new subroutine just below, I'm going to call it, I'm going to call it easy split. Why not? Um, so easy split. And then what we're going to do is declare another variable, which is going to hold a string, of course. I'm going to say dim s as string. And then I'm going to declare an array, but it's going to be an empty array. I'm going to say dim arr. I could have called it anything. And then open and close some parentheses as string. And then I'm also going to declare a final variable, which is going to be a variant, so dim v as variant. 
what I'm then going to do is set s to be equal to the value of one of my cells. So let's go for range A11 again, just to demonstrate this with a, a, a string which has lots of spaces in it. So s equals range A11 dot value. And then what I'm going to do, sorry, value, not validation. And then what I'm going to do is simply split that string based on the position of the space characters. But I can do it much more easily. And I'm going to store the results in my array variable. So I'm going to say ARR equals. Then there's a function called split, which is just so simple to use. If I say split and then open up some parentheses, the first thing is to say which string you're trying to split. So I'm going to say S followed by a comma, and then what delimiter character I want to use, which in this case will once again be a space character. There's a couple of optional parameters there as well, including the compare mode, so if I was using a specific character rather than a punctuation character, I'd want to make sure that I'm working in either case-sensitive or non-case-sensitive comparisons. But in this case, I can just close the, the round brackets, and that will store the entire name as separate values in separate elements of that array. Just to demonstrate that that's the case, if I step through up to that point, you can see in the Locals window, if you haven't got that displayed, head to the View menu and choose Locals window. And then if I execute this line by pressing F8, you'll see that that array gets populated with the correct number of elements based on the number of words in that string. And you can see they're all populated there. Each word is stored in a separate element. So the trick to that then is getting them all passed back out again. So if I just clear the contents of the immediate window, it's so easy to loop over a, an array, a single dimensional array like this one at least. We could just use our variant variable, we can say for each v in ARR, and then say next v. And for each one of those that we find in the array, I want to say debug.print v. You must use a variant variable to do this. It would make more sense if you could use a string, but you can't use a string variable to loop over using a for each loop. So once I've done all that, just run the subroutine one more time, and there we go. The uh, the entire film name separated into its constituent parts. We got another video that explains arrays in a lot more detail, which is why I didn't talk about it in quite so much detail right at this point. So there's another video in this series that explains everything there is to explain about arrays pretty much. So if you're interested in how arrays work in more detail, have a quick watch of that one. Just for the last part of the video, what I'd like to do now is create a slightly more practical example using some of the techniques we've encountered so far. So everything so far has been quite theory-based. I want to show you how to, to use this in context, I suppose. So what I've done is in the download link at the bottom of the video in the description, there's another file in the same little package, the same little zip file, which is just a basic text file. I've currently got mine sitting on my desktop. So I've called it High Gross. Uh, it's not about disgusting movies. It's about the, uh, the highest grossing films in my list. So it's a separate text file. If I just double click to open that one up, it's 10 films, the 10 highest grossing films, stored as a tab delimited text file. Now, Excel doesn't actually have any problem with opening tab delimited files or comma separated value files. We could do this fairly easily if we wanted the data in exactly the same format. But what I'd like to do instead is I'd like to read through each line of this text file. And rather than printing it out as, as individual rows, I'd like this data to go in as individual columns of data. So each film would be stored as a separate column rather than as a separate row. And to do that, I'm going to use some of the techniques we've looked at in this video so far. So I'm going to close down this text file and then head back to the VB editor. And I'm going to insert a new module, which I'm going to use to demonstrate these techniques. Now there are a couple of different ways of working with text files in VBA, but the technique that I find most convenient is working with a library called the Microsoft Scripting Runtime. Now we do have a separate video that explains this technique in a lot more detail. I'm going to, only going to sort of scratch the surface here to give you the basics, but if you did want to get a bit more information about how this works, it's part 23 of the Excel VBA um, introduction series. That's the one to go for if you want a bit more detail. Anyway, back to the VB editor and our Excel workbook. Let's start by heading to the Tools menu and choosing References. This isn't absolutely necessary, but it's, it's most, the most convenient way to, to work with scripting runtime is to set a reference to the Microsoft Scripting Runtime Object Library first. So if you scroll down through the list from the References Library, uh, sorry, the References dialog box, and look for the Microsoft Scripting Runtime, and there it is. Make sure you place a check in the box next to that, and then click OK. And what that does is it gives you, gives you access to a range of other classes for working with text files. So let's start by creating a new subroutine, which is going to be called something like split tab delimited data. And then we can create a couple of variables in here. Let's start with something called an FSO, which is short for a scripting dot 
file system object. So that's the object that you would use to work with text files and, and files and the file system in general, in fact, as the other video will tell you. I'll stop explaining it in too much detail here. I'm also going to use something called a TS as a scripting.text stream. And then another array, just as we did in the earlier um, subroutine. So I'm going to say dim ARR, open and close in parentheses as string, and then also a couple of integer variables for counting through our array. I'm going to say dim i as integer, so the loop will be slightly different this time, and then dim j as integer. So big, big pardon, not dim there, I can just say j as integer. Okay, so those are the variables set up. What I want to do next is open up the text file that is sitting currently on my desktop. So depending on exactly where you've stored this file on your own machine, the technique you're going to use here will be ever so slightly different. Well, the technique will be the same, but the file path, of course, will be different. So I'm going to say set ts equals fso dot open text file. Now the open text file method requires a file name as a string. So if I knew the exact file path, I could just type it in as a literal string. I know that it's sitting on my desktop, and there's a way that I can calculate the path to my desktop using another function called environ. So I'm going to say environ. Notice there's another a typed version of the environ function, so there's environ with a dollar sign as well as the regular environ function. Lots of examples of that in VBA, which you'll, I think, you'll probably start to spot now having watched this video. I'm going to go with a boring, lazy one, the one without the dollar sign, so I'm going to say environ, open some parentheses, open some double quotes, and then say user profile close double quotes in parentheses, then I can concatenate to the end of that a path to oh, the reference to my desktop, so a backslash desktop, another backslash, and then the name of the actual text files, that's highgross.txt. Close the double quotes. There's a couple of extra parameters to fill in here as well. So there's an input-output mode, which is set for reading by default, which is what we want. Then there's create as boolean, which is false, so it won't create the file for me again. And then this final format, which I don't need to change either. So I can just close the parentheses at that point, and that will open up the text file and making it available to be read by my VBA code. Once I've finished working with this data in the text file, I'm going to want to close the text stream. So just to establish that this is working properly, I'm going to give myself a few blank lines and then say ts.close. Then if I just step through the routine to make sure that all these instructions actually work, it opens the text file and then closes it and then enters the routine, that's established that I've got the correct path to that file. The text file itself doesn't open in a separate application. You'll probably notice you don't see Notepad open up, and it doesn't open it up into Excel. It opens a connection to the text file so that I can read the data in my VBA code. So that what I want to make sure that I actually write the data out into cells in a worksheet, and I don't want to do that in the existing worksheet. I want to create a new one. So I'm going to write another line that says worksheets.add. And then what I want to do is start looping through the different lines within that text file. So I'm going to use a do until loop this time. I'm going to say do until ts dot at end of stream. I'll give myself a couple of blank lines and then say loop. And then inside that loop, I'm going to do a few different things. First of all, I want to read the first line of the text file into my array, but I want to split it at the same time using a tab delimiter this time. So just as I did earlier on, I'm going to say ARR equals, then I'm going to use my split function, open some parentheses. This time the string is going to come from the text file. So I'm going to say TS dot. Then there's several different ways to read information from a text file. The one I'm going to go for here is called read line. So that reads an entire line up to the new line character. You remember we talked about new line characters in the uh, in the previous video. So visual basic CRLF, carriage return line feeds, that's um, what distinguishes the end of a line in a text file. So um, once I've read that, I want to make sure that I separate them using a tab character. And again, you may remember when we talked in the previous video about um, string constants in VBA, there's a VB tab constant that will look for a tab character. So I can then close the parentheses and that will store a line of text from the text file in the array. What I'd like to do now is loop through that array to write the values out into cells in the worksheet. To read the contents of the array, I'm going to use a for next loop. So I'm going to say for i equals then the number of iterations of this loop is going to be controlled by the number of elements in the array, which is going to be variable. I don't know necessarily how many elements it, each array will contain as I'm processing the do until loop. So for that reason, I'm going to use the l bound and u bound functions. I'm going to say l bound arr 
to U-bound ARR. So that guarantees that I'll always process the array from the bottom element to the top element, regardless of how big it is. Um, the array is based from zero, so I can um, guarantee that the the number contained in the i variable for the first iteration of the loop will be zero, and then the upper number will be uh, one less than the count of items in the array. I'll close that loop there by saying next i, and for each one of those, basically what I would like to do is write out the value stored in that element of the array to the appropriate cell. So I'm going to use the cells property to do this. I've just added a new worksheet, which means that I'm currently sitting in cell A1, but I'm not going to use the active cell property to uh, to refer to the cell I want to write the data into. I'm going to use the cells property to refer to a row index and a column index. So I'm going to say i plus 1. So i will first of all be 0. So I want to make sure that if I, re I want to write data right into row 1, then I've got to add 1 to the value of i. Likewise for the column reference, I haven't initialized the j variable. Its, it's, it's initial value will be 0, as I haven't assigned a value to it. So I can say j plus 1 as well. Then I can close the parentheses and say dot value equals, and then I can say arr, open some parentheses, and refer to the value of my i variable. I want to make sure that once I've processed a single row of data, that I then um, increase the column count. So I'm going to use j as the column count, basically, this time. So I'm going to say j equals j plus 1. I want to make sure, I don't actually have to do this, but what I want to do is make sure that I've erased the array or cleared the contents of the array once I've finished looping over a single row. That's just to make sure that I, I overwrite everything each time uh, and, uh, the array gets repopulated. So I'm going to use an er erase statement to clear all the contents of the array. I've then finished the loop and I've got the line which closes the text file. Just a tiny little bit of tidying up right at the very end, I'm going to say active cell dot current region dot entire column dot auto fit. So that will just make sure that all the columns will become the correct width for the data that I'm reading. All that remains is to give the entire system a quick test, so let's just run it. If I hit the play button or the run button or press F5, I ought to end up with a new worksheet in the workbook, and each column of that worksheet contains details for an individual film. So we've got the title and the release date, etc, etc. So there's a little bit of an example of, of a practical use, I suppose, for some of the string functions for splitting strings into their constituent parts. Um, I hope you found at least some of that useful and that you didn't already know all of that. Um, again, I tried to think you were sitting there thinking I know all of this already. Thanks for joining us for this one. Hope to see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you like what you've seen here, why not head over to the YSL website where you can find loads more free resources including these videos, some written blogs and tutorials, and even some exercises that you can download to practice your skills. Thanks for watching, see you next time.